Great. Okay, let's get started. Hi, my name is Dr. Jennifer Butler, and I'm the Director of the Office of Diversity and Inclusion for the College of Business and Analytics here at SIU. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I want to welcome everyone to our panel entitled Financial Health in the Post-Pandemic World. Thank you so much for joining us. Before I get too carried away, I wanna make a few announcements and then we'll get straight to our amazing speakers. So the first thing that I wanna do is say thank you to the Hispanic Latino Resource Center. They are co-sponsoring today's event and it's taking place in conjunction with Hispanic Latinx Heritage Month. Be sure to check out the rest of their events. They have quite a bit of things taking place during this month long celebration. I'll drop the link to the list of events into the chat after I finish these announcements. The second thing I wanted to mention is if you didn't just hear the announcement, we are recording today's event so that our online students have access to the recording at a later date. So just a heads up on that. The third thing is I'm going to be dropping a link into the chat that will have a virtual sign in form. So please, please sign in. This helps with our record keeping and actually several professors have asked to get a list of students who are attending because I think they're offering some sort of extra credit. So please, uh, don't forget to sign in. Even if you're not a student, sign in just because it helps us with our record. And then lastly, when it comes to questions, Nashira is going to be speaking. She's going to be sharing such amazing stuff. Feel free, though, to drop your questions into the chat box. I'll be monitoring that. If you're like me, you might forget it if you hold on till the end. However, if you want to ask them yourself, feel free, take a note, whatever. And we're going to have a Q&A session at the end of this. So, that's pretty much all the announcements I have. I'll drop all those things that I just mentioned into the chat. And so without further ado, please help me virtually welcome our speaker tonight, Nishira Linton. Thank you so much, Jen. Uh, while Jen's putting up uh, the presentation that I have, I would love, I know it's probably evening time and you guys are just getting out of class or maybe you're on your way home, but I would love to see your faces. If you would like to turn on your cameras, that would be amazing, but no pressure. I know a lot of us are probably zoomed out at this point, but um, like Jen mentioned, my name is Nashira Linton and I am the founder of a personal finance practice called Breaking Cycles. And she's gonna be showing the, um, starting the presentation. And this is me, this is me and my family. And today we're gonna to be talking about financial health from the inside out in a post pandemic world. Um, I, uh, this is a topic that's really close to my heart, financial health. Um, has anyone ever taken um, a personal finance course? School? you know, early on education. Yep, so I see one, okay. Anyone else? And, and for those of you who don't have your cameras on, feel free to use the reactions. I love to have an ongoing conversation. So, you know, and feel free to put in any questions and Jen, you can stop me at any point. This doesn't have to be structured, routine. Let's go down, um, down the PowerPoint list. Um, but I love talking about financial health. Financial health is something that's really near and dear to my heart. It's something that has changed my life. I'll share a little bit more of my story as we go through the presentation, um, but you'll start to uh, get a great idea of, of what financial health means to me. Also, I promise you there are no pie charts or graphs in here that is going to talk about if you stop buying coffee, how you can become a millionaire. That's not my thing. So if that's what you were expecting, I mean, please stay on, but it's not going to be in this presentation. Um, so next slide. All right, so like I mentioned, I'm Nishira. A little fun fact about me is that I love tacos and coffee. Anyone else? I love them never together, always apart. Yes, Sabrina. Um, so I am a lover of tacos and coffee. Can have them all the time, just never together. Um, I'm a mom of two overgrown boys. You saw them in the photo. At this point, they are towering over me and they're eating me out of house and home. So keep me in prayer. Um, and by October 1st, we would be celebrating three and a half years debt free. We paid off $60,000 in debt and built up a net worth of six figures. And one of the other things um, that I love to tell people about me is that I have a graduate certificate in financial therapy uh, from Kansas State University, which really shaped um, the vision for my business. Um, I mentioned before, 
I am the owner of Breaking Cycles. It's a personal finance practice where I help purpose-driven professionals achieve financial success so that they can live their life where their values inspire their financial choices. So this is just the highlights. Um, I love presentations like this because people always give you the highlights. But next slide. Um, what you'll find is that I actually, I came from, I'm first generation born here. So my parents came in the 1980s from Panama and they had me, their American child. So my siblings were born in Panama, I was born here. And they came here with an American dream. Um, they wanted to provide a better life for their family. My dad wanted to be the most successful um, fashion designer ever, ever worked the face of the United States. And you know they wanted to own home and be able to send their kids off to college. And, and that was great. And what, what they found here was something quite different than their American dream. They both started um, working uh, within a factory. And before you know it, they were working really long hours. My parents, I tell people, have some of the best work ethics um, that I ever could imagine. They've moved on to you know, other positions that, from when they started here. And um, while I can say that they had great work ethics, they did not have the best financial behaviors. I tell people, if I could be the first people that my parents met when they got off the plane, um, that's who I strive to be, that person who would have helped them with their financial finances. Um, but they came here with this dream, like many people, um, and they wanted to build a better life. Financially, they were, they lived on survival mode. Everything was about feeding their family and what they can do to build each other up. And while much of that has not changed, the reality is, is that financial the behaviors from back home weren't conducive to their financial behaviors here. And so the people that I work with, many of them start out with their own version of a dream. So if you go to the next slide, Jen, most of the people, when I talk to them about what their dreams are, what they really want is to create their own dream. It doesn't look like this out of date, traditional, old fashioned. I want the, the house with 2.5 kids and I want the dog and I want to be able to just do whatever I want. A lot of that has changed. Um, they want to create their own dreams. Many of them want to the ability to make choices, whether where they work, um, what state they work from, what country they work from, um, or even freedom, whether that be do they have to work. Um, a regular, not traditional nine to five or freedom to retire early and be able to aspire to do something that's even more near and dear to their heart. And a lot of them surprisingly also want security. So the security, when I, when I mean security, not just in safety, but security in their finances, knowing that if something happens, especially due to the pandemic, many people have realized that it's not just this three to six months emergency fund, right? We've been living in an emergency for quite some time now. And so they want that now that they understand this, I'm, I'm no longer talking people into creating an emergency fund. They're actually coming to me already with this desire to have a sense of security in some shape or form. So before we go on to the next slide, um, I would love to know, has any of your financial goals changed? since the pandemic. So if you're in school, um, maybe perhaps your passion or what you aspire to be has changed or, and financially that's also going to change when you think about that. Um, or maybe perhaps what you, in the next two, your one to three year financial goals, has anyone else had a change in their financial goals? No. Um, I had a change. So I wanted to own multiple investment properties, but because of COVID, people are allowed to not pay their their rent due to financial hardship. So I kind of realized that I can't put all my eggs in one basket. And that would be um, one of the scarcities to having multiple rental properties. So that kind of changed my, my whole goal to having multiple properties. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that, Sabrina. Um, I love that. I love the fact that you desire to to be uh, to own property and to be, you know, multi-purpose in 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 land owning. But it's it has changed for some people um, where there's scarcity. But in terms of if you're looking to do that in like Airbnb or that type of rental position, that that industry is still actually doing pretty well when you think about it. Um, so you can be open to that. 
Um, anyone else want to share? I think uh, Dr. Williams, you had your hand up. Yes, mine have changed because during COVID, um, I got married and now I have a blended family. And then we bought and sold a home. That was my first time doing that and move cross country. So all of that in the middle of a pandemic has definitely changed my priorities. Wow, thank you for sharing that. I love, um, well, congratulations on all those things. And I can tell that there must be a huge financial shift in your home anytime I talk to people who are going into blended families. Um, also a beautiful thing. But it's not traditional, right? It's not sometimes the way we, ex when we're growing up, we think it's gonna be. And that's how it was for me. Um, growing up, I had this huge desire to live in a financially different than what I saw growing up. Um, my parents, although they were making a good income at a certain point, they did live that paycheck to paycheck cycle. And I had decided that I was gonna do something different. I didn't want to live the paycheck to paycheck cycle. I didn't wanna always be um, have more month than I did finances. And so I desire, I had this one, not scarcity, in financial therapy, we call this money script, money vigilant. And so anytime I was making a purchase and it was too big, um, or even has a little girl, I would hold on to birthday gifts. I would hold on to money. I would hold on instead of being free with my spending. Um, and believe it or not, that actually hindered me from making a lot of the bigger choices that I needed to make as I went from being a young, well, being a child to being a young adult. So fast forward a few, I end up um, after high school, I end up getting pregnant with my first son. Um, so at 18, I was already pregnant. And by 19, I already had my first child. And I was starting college. And so for me, the one goal was now my priorities had my financial priorities had changed and no longer was go away to school and, you know, be some successful business owner. What I decided at that point was just to make sure that I had a great education and foundation so that I can support this little boy. Um, good thing I did because he eats a lot. You saw he's like six foot and he just keeps eating. Um, so I end up going and putting myself through college. My parents weren't prepared to put me through college. It was like more of you did great congratulations and you're you go figure it out and so I did I, I started off um, by taking out student loans I didn't ask enough questions I just knew that I needed money in order to put myself through college so I started out we went for my associates and along the way end up going for my master's um, with business I always knew that business was something that I wanted to do and so I ended up doing business finance with a concentration in finance and so by the time I was done with my master's degree um, I was on my second child and a year, a few months after that, I had found myself as a single mom living in New York City. Um, so pretty pricey, um, but I was working some, for some really great companies. And so education had allowed me an entryway into Wall Street. So I started off in it has an investment um, an investment administration and learning things about trades and stocks and investments and how people like numbers that I never could imagine. And so I was helping them calculate and trade and organize numbers that I had never seen a day in my life. Like I couldn't believe that that's what was going on behind the scenes or that people had money to what I thought was play at that time. Um, and I went on to work at really great companies like Bloomberg LP and learned a lot about the financial markets and then Dow Jones. And so those companies allowed me entryway to see what investing and managing your money differently could do. I just couldn't comprehend how that could happen for me. And so while I worked there, I was hanging out with people and eating and doing all the things that I could possibly do to network and to build relationships. And my spending, while I wasn't making big purchases, so you're not, I'm not the girl who was walking around with the most expensive bag, but I was making a lot of little purchases and I couldn't really, I was always finding myself needing to use a credit card at the end of the month. Does that happen to anyone else? You don't have to raise your hand, just silently sit there with that. Um, so I was constantly charging and charging. And by the time I was done with, with my master's degree between credit cards, student loans, personal loans, and, and God knows what else, I had about $60,000 in debt. 
And I knew that this was not exactly what I had desired for myself. One, I did not desire to be a single mom. But two, I also did not desire to have all this debt accumulation with no plan and no idea of what I was going to do. I knew another life was possible. Um, and I tried everything. And so I entered into this newfound relationship in my faith. Um, and, and that had started to stir my heart to say there had to be something different. And I couldn't go to my family. I couldn't sit down and be like, hey, dad, what do you do to manage your finances? Or mom, what's going on with your financial situation? How did you overcome your financial? So because they really didn't even know how to have those conversations. Um, it actually, up until a few years ago, was still really awkward to talk to my parents about money. And I would try to talk to my friends, but many of them were sitting in the same situation that I was sitting in. And I was so ashamed of my situation that I didn't talk to anyone at my job about it. There was so much shame around there that I just would hold it to myself. And I tell people I spent so much in interest and fees because of my shame, because I was unwilling to say, hey, raise my hand, I need help with this. So Jen, you can go to the next slide. So while I started, um, I took webinars, I took courses. I mean, I took you, there was a book, I read it. There was a course, I signed up. I actually decided that I was gonna learn this until I can teach it. And, Along the way, I decided to go to an association to get certified as a financial counselor, Be not because I wanted to help people. I mean, I love people now, but back then I just, I didn't like humans that much. And so I was like, I just want this for me, okay? I just need to get this done. And so I started learning about all these things about personal finances and I was doing really good. I wasn't making all the same choices, but there were a lot of things that I couldn't stick to. So everyone offered me a budget. I couldn't stick to a budget. Um, I started getting help and asking financial professionals, but all their recommend recommendations last about a week or two, or maybe even a month if it was a good one. And then along the way of getting my certification as a financial counselor, I attended an event that talked about financial therapy. And so I know some of you already know what financial therapy is. Jen already informed me. Um, but if you don't, here's a definition from the Financial Therapy Association. So this is a process informed by both therapeutic and financial competencies that help people think, feel, and behave differently with money to improve overall well-being through evidence-based practices and interventions. And once I was completed with my certification, I was like, sign me up, I need this. And so yes, I did go to therapy separate than this, but what I realized on my own journey is that I was broke, yes, and I was broken. And a lot of the financial behaviors that I, was, that I saw in my finances were based off that brokenness. I didn't know how to separate the two from my disappointments um, for the life that I was living. And so my thinking and feeling never showed up in my budget. People told me how to track my numbers, but they didn't tell me how to be aware about my thinking and my feeling. So you can go to the next slide, Jen. Here's one of the quotes that I have. I print out when I first originally started. It's from the Institute of Child Psychology. It says, beneath every behavior, there's a feeling. And beneath each feeling is a need. And when we meet that need, rather than focus on the behavior, we begin to deal with the cause and not the symptom. And that's what budgeting was doing for me. It was helping me treat the symptom, but not deal with the root problem. And so this doesn't work for everybody. Some people can get a budget, they can learn the techniques, and they can stick to it. But most of the people that I end up working with, it's not what they don't know, it's just what they're not doing. And so most of them know they, if they earn $1,000 a month, they need to live within the $1,000, right? Did you ever learn that, live within your means? Did anyone ever tell you guys that? Or save for a rainy day? So it's not sometimes the things we don't know, it's just why we're not doing them. And that's where breaking cycles comes in. I wanted to build a practice that helped people to create the space for people that actually helped them sit with that. What am I thinking? What am I feeling? What need am I meeting when I go and I make this purchase or even when I'm asking for a certain income rate? And so here I am, um, I was doing my business part-time up until 2019 when I got laid off. 
And I had never anticipated getting laid off. I've never actually ever got fired or been laid off for a job before. And so when this happened to me in 2019, I was like, oh, the nerve, the nerve of them. Um, but it allowed me the opportunity to take my business full time. And what, and I can tell you this, as a small business owner, I was not prepared for COVID. I wish I can tell you that I was super prepared and that everything went smooth. While I did see an influx in clients, there was still really hard times. But that emergency fund, the one that I ended up building, was actually something that helped carry me and my kids in a way smoother route than it would have had I not had that. And so while I was building, while I am still building this business, um, I, I want to let you guys know that no matter what degree you're in, no matter where you are on your own financial journey in school, starting an emergency fund is probably one of the best things you can do for yourself, even if it's $500. Um, it, it is something that one day we know that you might end up having to tap into. So next slide, Jen. So how does financial therapy show up? So this is a financial therapy matrix. I did not invent this. I actually stole it. I tell the financial therapy people all the time. I took this from my textbook, but I expanded on it. Okay, so we have everything on the left side, like from retirement to tax return. I just expanded for what my practice looks like. So on the opposite side of this, if you ever worked with a financial professional, you know, they, they talk to you about your future, right? That's how they help you build those goals, your present and your past. But in my practice, what we do is, yeah, we talk about those numbers. I am not an advisor. I don't invest your money. I help you prepare for that. Um, but we do talk about, you know, your goals. But I look at it from the three eyes perspective first, which is the internal. And we talk about impact, right? What are your dreams? What are your possibilities? So not everyone who's coming to me wants to buy a house or, or wants to buy a brand new car cash. Some people want to, I had one person who wanted to go on an 11 month missionary trip and not have to feel like she, you know, was going to not be able to complete the trip because of finances. I have some people, I, I work with um, during the pandemic, a single mom that despite what was going on, um, she was able to relocate from New York to Florida and buy her, you know, buy a house for her and her son. Um, so while everyone's dreams is different, there is an impact. There are dreams, there are possibilities on the what you want to leave or do in this earth um, with your time here. And we focus on influence. And this is a big part because it really deals with what is influencing your financial behaviors. Is it society, culture, family, all of that above, you know? Um, and then there's identity. And identity is surrounded around beliefs, emotions, stories, your stories, your personal stories and values. So I shared with you guys, I came from two um, parents who immigrated into the United States. And so when I tell you that if, when I interviewed my parents and understood their beliefs, their values and their stories, I saw how different they were from mine and how they, how really how they grew up the poverty, what they had to go through, how that helped shape who they have become. And so really understanding someone's story and their identity and their values is the biggest part. I actually don't start anything until we actually dig deeper into who you are. I like to call it the who before the do. So next slide. Another part about how financial therapy shows up in my practice, so you know, everyone gives you a budget. But for me, I give you a budget that comes with needs. And so when you're tracking money, and this is something anyone can implement. So there are over, you, know, you can do a needs list and you'll come up with over a hundred or maybe 70. I pick about 60. And for each transaction, whether it be income coming in or whether it be an expense coming out or debt or savings, Whoever works with me, when they're tracking their spending, they're also tracking their needs. So what need are they meeting? Oftentimes, for my own list, I'll be completely honest, it's, you'll see something like um, Grimaldi's Bakery. 
and it's not for food. We don't want it for food, but I'm passing by and I know my kids love the bread from there. And if it's between 6.30 to 7.30, I know it's fresh. And so I would stop my run, pick it up and take it home. It has nothing to do with food, but it has to do with love. And so I actually help people, you know, compile this list next to all their transactions and we go over the month what need they were needing most right what need were they needing the most so for example some people need communication more now than ever we've been isolated for at least 18 months or quarantined long enough for us to know that we might go crazy if we stay inside or isolated any longer so for some people their need to communicate to belong um has increased significantly. And so we track that to make sure, um, is there a way that we can meet this need without spending so much? And so I share this need list because there's a question on here that says, what need am I really meeting? And if you're a client or ever became one, one of the things that you would begin to ask yourself before or after purchases, what need am I really meeting? So think about that. Think about your last purchase, whether it was on your way to class or maybe you were picking something on your way up for someone at home. Think about that need that you were really meeting. Was it really just hunger? It could be, it could be food. Or was it belonging? Were you, did you stop and hang out with a few friends um, because they were gathering and you just wanted to belong? And here's the part where it gets a little hard because many of us don't want to deal with the need that we're really trying to meet. And so creating a space where people feel comfortable enough to do this work with me until they can do it on their own is super important for me before they even, you know, before we end our time together. Because deep down, I know that we've learned that there's needs and there wants, but beneath all of that, you're really doing something to meet some sort of desire. And it's not to be ashamed of the desire you're trying to meet or the need you're trying to meet, but it is so that you can recognize that when you're making your purchases. Um, because slowing down and allowing yourself to do that helps you make your purchases, right? Am I taking out another student loan because I really need it? Or just because I wanna have security or I wanna have cushion? I'll be honest, I took out a, a little extra chunk because my son's first birthday was coming up. And I was like, hey, I got no money to pay for this kid to do anything. Um, I needed a little living cushion. Um, and so it's just an opportunity for you to just sit with yourself. So if you don't write anything else down, um, I would love for you to write that question down. You know, what need am I really meeting? And you can do that right before purchases or even after um, just to keep yourself in check. So next slide. So financial health. Um, why do I call it financial health? Why don't I say I have a financial therapy practice? So one, I am not a certified financial therapist. That's actually uh, two years ago had became a real thing, just like a CFA or a CFP. And I don't have my CFT. I'm planning to study it for, for it. I'm making sure that I save to study and purchase um, the exam. And so I do believe that it is all about financial health and that looks different for everyone, but here's a definition that I like to use. So the dynamic relationship of one's financial and economic resources, resources has they are applied to or impact the state of physical, mental, and social well-being. I can't tell you or stress enough, I've had couples that I work with who come home with over 300K a year, yet still, have financial infidelity. They hide expenses from each other. I have people who are making $20,000 a year who still cannot understand why they spend so much on hobbies or traveling, knowing that they cannot afford it. It's not an income level thing. It's not of when you reach here. Um, financial health is something that it affects your mental and social well being. Because if I learned anything is that when we live, a life that's full of financial stress, it affects everything. It affects how we study. It affects how we work, how we communicate um, with our families, with our coworkers, with classmates, it affects everything. And so I believe that everyone has the capability 
um, to the best of their ability. Obviously, there are places in the world that they probably don't have that ability yet. But we can do the best we can in order to have financial health by incorporating some of these techniques that go beyond just budgeting. It goes beyond just tracking your income and your expenses. It really helps you take a look at what you value. So for example, my belief is something that I hold as a priority in my life. And so that should show up in my finances. Also, I love my babies. And so when you see my food budget, <laughs> you can see how much I love them. Um, a lot of my expenses or a lot of the things that I treat them to shows up in food. It shows up in love that way for them. And we talked about it. So it's not something I hide from them. I say, I purchased this just because I wanted to do something nice for you. Um, before we move on to the next half of the presentation, are there any questions or anything that you think I may have missed or you want me to dive into? If not, Jen, just give me a thumbs up and I could um, keep going. All right, so next slide. So here's a client feedback. I was working with a client last Wednesday and in preparation of this, I asked her if she could send me over some feedback. And so here's something that she wrote. I only highlight in bold some of the words that um, stood out to me, which makes me feel like, oh, she gets me. Um, and, and that's really the words that we use in our conversations weekly. And so I do group programs. Um, I started them last year during the pandemic, but I really, um, what I have been doing for the past uh, two years have been one-to-one -one client work either with couples um, or individual. And so when she says, um, she has a fin fantastic financial mentor who, whose guidance and services are not only practical, um, but have been really incredible incredibly meaningful to my own personal growth. Um, thanks to her support, I have been able to change my understanding of my finances and my relationship to money. She has helped me rewire my mindset when it comes to how I look at my finances. She has guided me with personalized tools to create a manageable budget and a workable financial plan. And I'm now able to face my financial issues head on with her help and find solutions that are in line with my values to help me achieve my goals. Uh, my individual sessions with Nishira have given me incredible awareness and financial tools that I use for the rest of my life. So I highlighted those words like personalize my relationship with it because really personal finance, you hear this a lot, is personal. And if you're going to something that is real clear and cookie cutter, um, if you're going to an app, if you're going to read a book, you have to figure out how do I make that personal for myself, right? As a Hispanic woman, I know that I have to incorporate um, how do I still align with what I believe when it comes to helping family, right? So I come from a family who they believe if one person eats, everyone eats, right? So they, if someone asks you for money because they need help um, or, you know, they think you're doing really well successfully, they may rely heavily on you as a, you know, as a family member. I need to know what are my boundaries when I am helping, but also um, where can I prepare for that? And so I have something that's called a generosity fund. So every time mom calls them, tap it here's what I can do and I tap into the generosity fund because while I may not have all the same beliefs as my mom I do believe that I am able to give back to her or to others in some sort of way and so when I help people make their personalized plan I take into account they're never wrong if someone believes that they should be spending $150 on coffee a week that's what you value let's think about what need you're meeting when you go have your coffee and Let's decide how does that fit into your budget? What are you willing to sacrifice in order to continue having that $150 budget for coffee? I'm using coffee as a budget example because everyone told me, stop drinking all that coffee. But I love coffee and my coffee conversations were really helped me. Um, I would take a mentor out for coffee. I would take a coworker and be like, hey, do you need a break? 
let's go take that walk. Coffee was never just about the taste and how I, you know, my little boost. It was a moment for me to connect to people. I have amazing conversations still to this day, virtually over coffee. And I'll send someone a $5 coffee gift card um, because for me, it was connection, right? And I didn't give that up. I never, I set a $20 limit when I was going debt free, um, but I never gave it up. And so for me, I don't come in and tell people, you should get rid of this and you should get rid of that. It's personalized to that person. And I want you to think about that if you ever decide, okay, it's time for me to get my finances in order and I want to know what to cut back and what to do. Think about why you gravitate towards that, what need you're meeting. And if you need to pull back, do so in a way that doesn't make you feel deprived. Because once we start feeling deprived, we no longer want that budget, right? After 20 days, we're like, oh no, I'm throwing this out the window. I need to go. I need to go meet up with my friends. I need to go out to eat. Um, and so I know that's probably not the financial advice that you were thinking you were gonna hear, but I wanna tell you this. If what we've realized over the past few months is that our time here could be limited. And I would hate for you to deprive yourself um, I know that instant gratification is not, you should not, you should prepare for that. So what I'm telling you is if you get income or you have money coming in, set aside the money for what is a priority. And if doing something fun, if taking a venture once a quarter or traveling to see family back home is something that's important to you, prepare for it because you're meeting some sort of need that your heart really desires. Sure, go ahead. Um, how do I say your name? So mm -hmm. introduce yourself first. Okay. Jamila. Worked with anybody who's trying to budget for an addiction? Um, in what sense? So they're budgeting for... Maybe student. alcohol is something that they spend a lot of money on and they want to budget that or um, some, some sort of substance that they indulge in. Actually, no, I have not. I've had a few clients who um, would be referred to me from their therapist. So they are already in therapy getting help for something. I don't question what they're in therapy for, but when I'm working with them, they would usually give me clues as to what they want to stay away from, right? Um, so let's say, for example, if it's going out to happy hour, I don't question, is it because you're an alcoholic? Um, but they would say, oh, I need to stop going to happy hour. That's, you know, something like that. Um, but I've never actually helped them budget around their addiction. Most of the people I help them not, we don't focus on what you need to stay away from. We focus on what you need to move towards. So I like to tell people live, make financial choices based off your values. So if you value something, you know, I know that you guys are in school, you must value education. I won't tell you, I think you should cut back on school and go get a job, right? So I'm going to tell you what you should be doing. How do you prepare for that? How do you maybe cash flow some of your expenses so that you can decrease the amount? Um, hope that answers your question. But no, yet I have not yet. And if I did, I probably would refer them. I know my boundaries. I'm not a financial therapist. I'm not a therapist, but I do incorporate therapy techniques, financial therapy techniques that I have studied and learned. I am not a therapist. And so I know where the boundary lies and I would refer them out um, either to a network of therapists that I have that also does referrals to me, or I help them find a therapist. One maybe perhaps within that their insurance actually covers so that the expenses won't add up for them. Okay, yeah, thank you. That answered my question. Of course. So we can go on to the next slide, Jen. And so here's just an additional slide, right? You only get one life. And so if you were, you know, I do an exercise and if you were sitting around the table and it was your 80th birthday, right? And you're wearing the best outfit ever. I mean, you still look great. Um, what do you, when you think about like people talking about who you are and how you influence their life and the impact that you have created, what would you want to be said at that table? What do you want to, what words do you want to hear? And that's the life that I try to help people live based off the things that they want in these three categories. So next slide. And so before we go on to a few steps, right? Um, I, I'll take any questions if, if you guys have any more questions. 
these steps are not something that I tell people. It's like hard, you know, you have to stick to these steps, but they're just the few tips um, besides whatever, whatever I already mentioned to you guys before. But these are things that I've done in my own personal finance. Um, and you can incorporate this with any um, financial program that you're doing that will help you deal with a lot of the internal. So first thing, um, conduct a personal finance audit. And I don't just mean of your finance. I actually mean to start with those three eyes that I told you about. Who are you? Who or what is influencing your financial decisions? And what kind of impact would you like to make in this world? Then I want you to assess your finances. And that's where all the money talk comes in, right? Like download the apps, track your finances by either writing them down, you know, go grab a pen and paper, have a money date with yourself, bring the wine, bring the water, bring the coffee, whatever floats your boat. And just sit down and track your expenses. Um, if you can't do 30 days, I would suggest um, start with just a week. What did I do last week? Believe it or not, just getting into the routine of looking actually helps. And then communicate your finances. And so if you're single or if you're in school and maybe perhaps you're not dorming with someone or you live on your own, it's hard for you to really process. Or I should say this, it's hard to process information that you find unless you actually communicate what you found. So I said, I, I wanted to learn it until I can teach it. I actually really didn't start to master it instead of, until I started talking about it. And so if you can find someone who's like an accountability buddy, or if you start telling your best friend, hey, before we jump into complaining about all five things that we normally complain about, I need to spend about five minutes telling you what I found about my money. And I don't need your answer. I just need you to listen. And so once you hear yourself process that information, it's good for you. Okay. And then um, next slide. And so number four, plan for saving and debt. And so if you know, okay, I'm accumulating a little bit of debt while I'm here um, in school or you know wherever area you are, you wanna make sure that you plan for this. If you can't plan to pay off your debt right now, plan for future debt. I know that doesn't make sense because you're like, should you not recommend that we take out debt? Okay, I, I say you should plan or whatever your future spending is. So there are some people who are dead set on what they're gonna buy for Black Friday, what they're gonna buy for Christmas gifts. And most of them have not created a way to pay for that in cash. And so they are going to take out some debt in order to pay for this stuff. I can't prevent that. But what I can tell you is that you can create a plan for that. You can create a plan on what you're gonna buy, who you're gonna buy for, or what you're gonna spend on, how could you get the best rate for it, and how are you gonna pay it off, okay? Um, or if you know that your grace period will be ending soon um, uh, for your student loans, uh, we, I, we know that it's been extended to January for some people um, based off that new uh, bill that got passed. And so if you know that your student loans are gonna kick in for, for those of you who are not in school anymore. You wanna make sure that you have a plan on how you're gonna pay that back or you start calling them for now and discussing and having those conversations. And then savings, you can do the same for your savings. The same calculators that people use for debt, they can use for savings as well. It, you'd be so surprised by if you start to see um, what money manager, sure, I'll get to that in a second. Um, so you can definitely use the same calculators or you can find savings calculators just like you can find debt calculators all over. Um, and then five is manage your money. So when I say manage your money, I mean know your numbers. Um, there are apps and there is, pro, you know, banks and things like that that know more about you than you. I want you to know more about your own numbers than someone else or some app or some AI knows about you. And so that really means spending time knowing your numbers, whether it be once a week or um, five minutes a day just to track, okay, uh, what did I do today? And then just putting it to the side until you can have maybe once a week check in with yourself, with your spouse, with your family, or whoever it is um, that needs to be part of that conversation. And then six, I want you to think about what would it cost you. So if you go back to the three eyes, if you start thinking about a lot of the spending or income that's coming in right now, 
what is it costing you? So if you went and took this trip, does it cost you what you're saving for? Because when you say yes to something, you have to say no to something else. And so oftentimes when someone's in the store and they're like, oh, those last five minute items, like what is it costing you? Is it costing me an extra hour of work to now have to pick up another shift or take on a few more hours to pay that off? Which means that now I lose time in doing something else that I may enjoy. Or does it mean that I have to sacrifice being able to pay for something else in order to have that? And then seven is reward yourself. So I love to build a reward system in any personal plan. And so if you did something straight for three months, celebrate it. I don't mean go splurge. I said celebrate, right? There's a difference. And so we even plan for rewards, whether it be an extra trip with the spouse or whether it be like uh, a splurge dinner, um, things like that. So always try to reward yourself. Uh, with something fun or something that brings you joy within your five senses. So maybe you hug someone a little longer or um, you, you go take an extra walk or you look at a sunset or a sunrise. It doesn't have to be something you actually pay for to treat yourself as a reward. And so last slide, I believe, is Q&A. And okay, actually, so know your numbers. You know, some of the questions that I would ask a client is, you know, what does it cost to live in your household? Right, a lot of people don't know that number, and so if you think, yeah, so Miss, you know, Miss Lewis, you asked that question about, um, you know, have I helped clients? A lot of the times, clients, whether they're focused on addiction or anything else, I'm gonna ask them the same question. You know, what does it cost to live in your household? And a lot of people, you'll be surprised they can estimate, and they're usually wrong by the time we're done. And so, even if it's just like. Even if you're on campus, you want to think about that. What does it cost for me to live um, in a month on campus? What are all my expenses for this one month? And so how much does it cost to run a business or how many hours do I have to work? Um, and so this is a question that either for business owners or so someone who's actually um, earning income right now, um, how, many, how many hours do I have to work? Um, so if it costs $3,000 to live in my household, or if you have kids like mine and they eat a lot, you might need to earn a little bit more. Um, how many hours or how much, how, how do I have to run my business or how much do I have to earn in my business to take a salary in order to not be underwater or leaving paycheck to paycheck? And then what would it cost to take it to the next level? And so I'm not just about living and, and being comfortable. I always try to stretch people. How can you go a little bit further? Whether that means, can you pick up an extra hour and put that towards saving? What is the next level look like for you? So if you're earning $1,000, how do we sit down and talk about getting a raise? How do you have that conversation with your boss? Um, or how do you talk to your creditors about bringing down your interest rate so that you can pay that off faster? So anything that's next level, you don't have to incorporate that right away, but it is good takeaway for you. And so let your values inform your financial choices. I think my clients get tired of hearing that, but I tell them over and over, because again, at the end of the day, what you value should inspire how you spend and how you earn. So next slide. And so Q&A. Um, and Jen, if you want to stop sharing the screen, um, that's fine. I would love to see more faces on, on, on the screen all at once. Sounds good. Thank you. But, yeah. Um, um, can so I ask I, you a question? Of course. Okay. So um, I'm also a single mom, so I, I really resonate with your message today. And I feel like I'm, a, I'm mature in my financial life because I've created multiple streams of income. But now I'm in a, I guess, a plateau because I'm comfortable where I'm at. Um, like I have like one source of income, I trade my time for money. One source of income is from stocks. Another source is a rental property. And like, it's not, it's when I look at the numbers, it's not as big as I want it to be. But then because the money's coming in, I also want to create more income, but I also see myself consuming more because the money's coming. So what is your advice as far as that? Because I'm still young. I have a toddler and like my debt is like, I have a paid off car. My rental property's paid off. The condo I live in it, it I have debt on it still. 
but I want to get a house but then I also want to have like just like more like again so I want to be able to, to produce more than what I'm consuming so what is your advice on that so I would say congratulations uh, right so you sound like you have a really great understanding of where you are financially yes. um, what I would say is take it deeper um, so you mentioned having a toddler and yes. taking it next level if that means you know that might be what it costs you right less time with your toddler um, and so you have to really figure out for you I would write down first what's your priority at this moment you may have one to to three things that may be a priority for you. Um, and no one's able to tell you uh, what's the right one to work on, right. only you can do that. And so once you have your priority list, I would say what you're consuming right now says a lot about where you're gonna consume when you make a little bit more. And so if you take a look at what you're consuming at and you go back and think about that and assess that, yeah. Then you can kind of understand, how can I put a cap to this? How do I not go above this? So when I first started working, guys, I was making $13 an hour working, working for the city of New York. And I thought that was gold because at the time, minimum wage was $8. And my expenses were through the roof at that point. I mean, everything from needing childcare. And for anyone who knows, childcare is super expensive it could be almost the cost of rent and yeah. so my expenses has went through the roof and so what I had to end up doing was capping it so no matter how many times I got a raise no matter how many times I moved jobs I had to say this is actually how far I'm willing to go on this expense on this expense and this expense so my toddler's only two and she changed my life. So ever since I, that's when I went back to school. So when I got pregnant, I was full-time work, full-time school. And like, it's just been all grind from there. Yeah. And just like, so before her, I was really young and I spent a lot of my time and money partying. And now I don't do that, but now I like spend things to make myself feel better. So now like when I, one of the points you made was to reward yourself. So me as a female, I take myself to the nail salon <laughs> and like, I'll get my hair done. Like I never used to do that. So like now I do that as a reward for my hard work, but then that stuff adds up. And especially post COVID to go get your nails filled, which was like $25 before it's like $70 these days. And so it's like a compromise and a sacrifice. So like, I guess what you said, go kind of going back to what you said, do the priorities, but then like, how do you know, like, when do you spend that extra money on the extras? So like my car's paid off. So now I'm thinking, oh, how can I get a much more nicer car? You know, so it's when do you spend the money on the luxury things is is I guess another follow up question is what I have. Yeah, I'll tell you this. When you're spending on yourself, you're meeting a need something inside of you needs something, whether it means I need to, you know, one of the needs list is beauty, right? Maybe I just need to feel, I need to feel, do the whole beauty thing and make myself feel good. And, and that's okay, as long as you can plan for it. So it adds up. One of the things yeah. when I went up free, I decided to stop spending on my nails and my hair. I had to learn how to do them myself. And that was really yeah. hard. When I started rewarding myself, I introduced it, but only back again once a month. And so it was really planned behavior. I wasn't being reactive. And so if I'm rewarding myself, there's a bucket somewhere that says, here's your reward money. Um, and in terms of like upgrading your lifestyle, right? Um, upgrading yeah. your home, upgrading your car, upgrading, those things come as you grow. But when you plan for them, they're not unexpected. They don't become unexpected expenses because when you slow down with your finances and you have a priority list and you're living based off your values, you begin to shift from being a reactive person to a proactive. So now planning to purchase the car that's a luxury car becomes something I'm prepared to do rather than someone who's walking in and has to kind of figure it out and go into a bad deal maybe just because I really need it right now and that's the date I set for myself. Instead, you become proactive. You begin to look at those things and say, oh, in six months out, seven months out, I would like to have a new car. What behavior do I have to have right now 
in order to be a person who owns that car and not drown in debt. And that behavior changes. That behavior changes how you begin to spend, how you begin to plan for debt. Um, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, yeah. I, it, I, the one takeaway is that uh, 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 I forgot how you said it, but it's like uh, spending money on your based on your values, so that you're not going in there unexpected. It's all planned. And then the example you used, it really like I understand exactly what you're trying to say. I, I do like you plan it so that you're not getting it unexpected. And then you're going based off your values, not like, oh, I like not based on impulse. It's all planned out. Everything is just planned out. I, I understand. Yeah, because once we, we, when we set ourselves up for that and we don't plan, now we're all in our feelings, right? Oh my God, that car deal didn't go through and now I have to try to figure out something out. Now I need a co-signer and now I need mom and dad who are already in debt to come in and co-sign for me or I need someone else to put on this list or I need to just go into a bad deal and now we're being moved based off our feelings and our emotions, right? That's reactive and we want to be proactive. And you want to become someone who is proactive in all your behaviors um, because then financial stress never goes away. Um, by the way, there is no like pill for it. I looked, um, but what we can do is we learn how to manage and we learn how to become, to be aware of what that stress is trying to tell us. Maybe we do need to slow down. Maybe that deal is not right. Maybe we need to wait another month and accumulate. Maybe we knew, need to earn more income before we make certain purchases. So I just want to add to that. Can I add to that? Like how comparison could be the thief of joy too. And then we, we struggle with comparison and instant gratification. We think we need it now. And we're always trying to keep up with the join Joneses too. So yeah, that can and also we learn now it. in our virtual world, the Joneses is everywhere, right? There's no, they're no longer next door. They're like on our phone. We can kind of turn yeah. it, turn on our phone and see what the Joneses, but I just want to be respectful of the time. And I just want to say thank you to Jen um, for inviting me the conversation. She has such a great heart for all the students and staff there. And she just thought that this would be an amazing conversation to have. And so I'm so thankful for her. Also for the Latino group that um, was sponsored this event. I'm so thankful just to know that you guys will be um, willing to sponsor the event so we can have this conversation. It's such a beautiful thing to see uh, school doing. And so thank you so, so much for having me. Um, I'm open to answering any additional questions, but I'm gonna hand it over to Jen. Oh, thank you so much. This has been wonderful. I wanted to say really fast in case you missed it or you joined in a little late, I did drop the form or actually I didn't, I switched off. But Myra dropped a form that has a link or she dropped a link to a form that's the virtual sign in. And then also if you scroll all the way up, uh, there's the link to the rest of the events. Now, I also just dropped in your contact information. So if they want to get in touch with you personally, your LinkedIn, your website, or your email, it's in the chat. So if that's something that y'all want, go for it. Um, Nashira, if you don't mind, let's see if there's maybe one or two other questions. And then if not, we'll adjourn. But I just wanted to give someone uh, a chance to jump in there as well. Sabrina had some really great comments and points, but I want to make sure I see a hand up. Would you like to go, sir? Yeah. Yes. Um, I just want to know, like, how do you like deal with investments that go bad? So like, if you're constantly trying to invest your money, because I remember you saying at the beginning that you were like, you know, you wasn't frivolous, but you were like holding back from making investments and you thought that that would help you. But like, what if your investments are going bad? How do you deal with that? Yeah. So one of the things that I've learned, especially working at such a large company like Bloomberg, right, everything is based off up and down, up and down model there, even the elevators, red, green, like up, down, it's crazy. Um, but one of the things I've learned, especially talking to mentors, financial professionals, is that I have to decide how long I'm in it for. And so I'm in it for the long haul. And so I am not an active day investor. I'm not an active trade. So right now, today, my stocks or my investments could be down. Um, but I am not going to let that worry me um, when it comes to investing in the stock market um, because I'm in it for the long haul. And I know I those were picked and studied and I am 
planning and hoping that they go back up. And I monitor that uh, with a financial professional who's trained in it so that they can help me determine, is it time to get out of that? Or should I move on to something else? And so I had to do a lot of work with myself in terms of how I invest and what type of investor I am. And so they are investing um, personality types, just like there's money personality types. And so when things go bad or things like there are things that drop um, that or things that get bought out and sold and they happen and I have no control over them. What I do have control over is what I do next and what I learn from it, right? And so what did I learn about that stock? What did I know? Why did I even go into that um, investment and that deal? And that teaches me. So the failures are really there for lessons. And we got to remember that this stock market, it's not a guarantee. Um, but in terms of like other investments, like my education and things like that, um, could I have done a better job? Yeah, um, I could have probably picked a major or something or done something different, but I do look for the good in it. And so some of them offer lessons and some of them are just for experience. Um, but that's something that the stock market has told me. There are going to be always going to be ups and downs. And I just have to decide, am I in it for the long haul, which I do believe that they'll go up. Uh, but I'm not a day trader. I don't have the heart for it. All right. Any other questions before we There was go? one question. That came, one question came in to me, Jen. Okay. Uh, oh, okay. And it was from uh, Michelle. She talked about mo what man money management sites or app would I recommend for individuals who are serious about financial health, but don't have a support system to rely on um, or confide with. And so one of the things, one of the apps that I, when I first started, I was using Mint. I know you guys probably heard of mint.com, um, but then I moved on to personal capital. And so personal capital really helps me see what my net worth is in total. It tracks my expenses and it helps me um, see everything big picture if I needed to on the go. And so personal capital is not a budget man managing app, but it does give you an outlook on what your net worth is. And so I'm at a point where, yes, I do have investments. And so I want to see where they are at any given time, but also I want to see that with my normal, um, with any type of credit cards or any type of cash, liquid, liquid cash that I have. And so I use personal capital, um, but there is mint.com and there are a ton of other apps. I'm more than happy to send the list over to Jen that she can probably share with anyone who um, did the sign up. That would be great. Awesome. Any other questions? Anyone? All right. On that, oh, oh, there's a hand. <laughs> there's a one, hand. More. one more. All right, we're going for the grand last one. Are you ready? Yeah. So I'm based ready. off of your needs list, would you think that people spent more money preparing for the pandemic, just buying a bunch of like things in bulk during when everybody was like online or like now with everything being back open? I think people made that decision based off of scarcity, mm -hmm. right? So a lot of the people that I worked with um, who did actually accumulate a large amount of stuff, it was scarcity. It was fear. I'm afraid to run out. I'm afraid what would happen if I don't have enough water? What would happen if I don't have enough? I don't know anyone who bought a bunch of toilet paper. I probably would have never worked with them because that's just that's not nice. And so, um, but there was fear, right? And there's no shame in having fear. I'm, I'm afraid. I don't know what, I've never lived through a mass trauma like that. And so we kind of expected some behaviors to be a little different. Um, but I do believe that a lot of those purchases, the need was either scarcity or fear-based, not so much, I have this like desire to have a bunch of food in my house, you know, yeah. just more of a fear-based decision. And I think that that was expected. I allowed them the space to, to talk about that fear. And then, of course, during was a lot of um, just not things being open, mostly. So, of course, people were ordering online. But um, do you think there'd be a big influx in, like, um, just as of right now with things opening back up, just an influx of purchases again? Yeah, actually, spending, consumer spending is really up. I mean, it's like 43% the last time I checked. People are traveling, like, a, like you know, they increase their amount of traveling, they increase their spending, you know, like she mentioned about nails and toes and hair and all that stuff. There's a huge amount of consumer spending and it's good to a certain degree, 
but the one thing is that then savings go down, right? So a lot of people were saving, savings were up and now consumer spending is up. And so the difference is, is monitoring how do we have the both? Cause we need consumer spending. I need you to be, to purchase from my small business um, in order for me to thrive and then go out and so that I can spend, right? That's how our world works. It's doing it based in a way that's affordable that again aligns i don't want to just be frivolously oh my god i'm free let me make all these purchases you know that's yeah. how i felt when i first walked out the door i was like oh my god they let me out away from the kids like give me everything um but when you start to you know have some self-awareness you then slow down and you start to say okay what do i really value right now what do i really want to make purchases on and so yes consumer spending is up savings is not up but um, i'm hoping that people will be able to find that balance between the two Okay, thank you. Of course, thank you for having questions. I appreciate it. Oh, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much to everyone who's still here. Thank you for the questions. Thank you for the conversation. Nishir, it was amazing. And Christina, thank you so much for co-sponsoring this event with us. It's been just a joy. Would thank you like to say anything? <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. This was wonderful. And thank you for collaborating with, uh, with Hispanic Latino Resource Center. It's always a pleasure. So uh, this was really uh, awesome. I've, I have some of the um, things, not just for financial with uh, students, but in general, in all the, um, um, the the in 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 the time in time management in financial in spiritual in social what are the things how we can break cycles right especially for marginalized communities so uh, this was really nice and and uh, it resonates a lot with me and how I uh, try to uh, um, engage with students as far as uh, their well being uh, and it's it's really uh, great thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. <laughs> All right, that concludes this event. Thank you so much. Don't forget, if you want to reach out to Nishira, I put her information, and if not, you can always reach out to me and I can forward you her information, her contact information. Thank you, and have a wonderful evening. Bye.